Thank you for that very warm welcome. When she entered the executive mansion, her new home, it was with a great deal of trepidation. Her husband's elevation to the presidency had followed years of struggle, but was a well-deserved triumph which she savored. She had served him as a political sounding board, promoted his best speeches, his career in government, and stood by her man, despite family conflicts, which gave the couple a bumpy start to their marriage. The conflict between in-laws was but one of many obstacles in the couple's marital happiness as they had lost a child, a young son. But this early tragic loss seems to have been healed. She had given him other sons. And now, as they moved into this new home with young children, they embarked on a new phase of their lives. She could not expect to rest on her laurels. Her skills as a political wife, well acknowledged, would be tested, as would her husband's talents during 1861. She moved into her new home and brushed aside rumors that she was partial to the enemy because of family connections. The new president would need all her support, and she remained true to his cause, convinced he would lead his nation to victory. Yet it pained her to endure a home constantly besieged by those begging favors, advice, influence, all unburdening as well as demanding, alongside legitimate interruptions by military men and diplomats and others whom the wartime president must administer to. She hated to see his face become worn with care, his frame even more gaunt, his health even more precarious in the White House than out of it. Detractors found her style imperious as she played favorites, matchmaker, and more from her perch at the center of the presidential court, a natural target for gossip and bad press among jesters and hangers-on. She earned a royalist nickname, repeated behind her back, but tried to maintain regal repose, despite reports to the contrary. Many of her household employees, black and white, defended her against criticism. Perhaps they were as moved as the nation, as she would lose a child in the White House. And this is where the story begins. I hope some of you can recognize that this is a tale of two first ladies, as this could apply to either Verena, second wife of Confederate President Jefferson Davis, and his first lady in Montgomery, then Richmond, or to Mary, Abraham Lincoln's first and only wife. But it will be the larger story of mourning interwoven with the deaths of these two symbols of sons lost, and how mourning became perhaps the most potent ritual in Civil War America. The death of a child remains something extremely traumatizing, yet something all too common in 19th century America. Statistically speaking, most antebellum American mothers could expect to lose a child, primarily at the tenderest of ages, during infancy, or at least before adulthood. Scholars continue to debate this core factor in 19th century parenthood. I don't think it's a germane issue to outline analytical, ideological battles. Suffice to say, there is evidence on both sides, but the argument boils down to parents being distraught over children's funerals, no matter how common it became. Perhaps this is what drove so many Americans, 40%, according to Richard Carwydine, into the arms of evangelical Christianity during the early decades of the 19th century. The world was becoming more networked, more accessible, more modern, and yet children kept dying, one in 10 infants before the age of one during mid-century. And childhood mortality reached one in four for America's white parents. Of the four sons she bore, Verena Davis only had one son live to adulthood, and he predeceased her, dying at 21. One of her daughters died, and one of her daughters survived her, so Verena gave birth to six children, but outlived all but one. Mary Lincoln lost two boys at three and 12, and one son at 18, and only her oldest, Robert Todd Lincoln, survived his mother. Within this climate of dread, fear, and a parade of family loss, American writers in mid-century appealed to sentimentality with stories, images, poems about dying children intended to comfort grieving parents. A verse from the English Woman's Domestic Magazine in 1863 reflects this. Immortal bud of mortal birth, to thee 
brief date was given. The flower that was too fair for earth is called to bloom in heaven. People had to find ways to cope with the overwhelming consequences of childhood mortality. In 1854, Caroline Howard penned a piece about the death of a child. In the sleep of death, with white hands intertwined upon her breast and flowers round her pallid marble face that she loved best. So Howard, like many of her sister scribblers, tried to soften the blow of loss by portraying a deceased child as calmly reposed. This might have worked to some effect in the antebellum period, but by the time of the Civil War, mothers and indeed fathers were drawn into a very different dynamic. The maiming and slaughter of hundreds and thousands of sons during the four years of the Civil War imposed an unimaginable burden, bringing down the curtain of reality. Civil War scholar Drew Faust has told us much about death in mid-century, as does Rick Burns' new film, Death in the Civil War. Faust's Republic of Suffering chronicles key features of the era, the good death, the oars mori, the hour of death to be witnessed and narrated. She movingly describes the pain and sorrow of losing loved ones to die as strangers in a strange land, the soldier's lot. And I recall uh, a while back, I was moved to tears on a Remembrance Sunday in Scotland because in the UK they have quite a beautiful ceremony every November to mark the passing of soldiers. And a marker was erected for those who served, who were lost at sea, for loved ones who had nowhere but this memorial to mark their loss before they could only toss memorial wreaths into the ocean and watch them bob across the waves and sink, which struck me as unimaginable cruelty. Before 1900, less than 20% of Americans died away from home. So the Civil War was the largest most cataclysmic anomaly for 19th century death. Faust points out General Orders Number 33 dealing with soldiers' burials includes phrasing as far as possible and when practicable. War imposed crushing expediency and the times were indeed a changing. Generals were hired and fired to wage war. Union General George Meade complained after Gettysburg, I cannot delay pick up the debris of the battlefield. And so at Gettysburg, as it was elsewhere, many women were drafted to pick up the pieces like the ill-fated Elizabeth Thorne. Keeping track of the wounded and dead was even more challenging. The Union established centers in Philadelphia, Baltimore, Louisville to keep count of the more than a million names that ended up on official ledgers. Clara Barton heroically spent a good number of years devoting time and energy tracking down soldiers who were lost and abandoned by the system enlisting them, but still sought families that gave them up. With her efforts, more than 20,000 soldiers were cleared from the missing list, and it's only a year ago, through the effort on the part of the Museum of the Civil War Medicine and the GSA, that the building in Washington, D.C., where Barton carried out much of her work, is being rehabilitated into an historic site. Faust argues that the Civil War as the first modern war can be called such in part because it created accountability for those who served their country. The government henceforth would be required to undertake notification of next of kin, proper burial, fitting commemoration. Eventually the state would donate benefits to families of the dead, families of veterans. Families of Civil War soldiers were perpetually consumed with the business of survival. Ministers encouraged the grief-stricken to vent or it will break the heart, but they also warned of exhibiting any excess of sorrow. Mourners should not forget the afflictions of others or become, quote, neglectful of responsibilities to personal health. 19th century women were tasked with a very delicate balancing act. The mourning customs required by Victorian propriety were quite exacting. A mother mourned a child for a year, and a child mourned a parent for a year. Siblings and grandparents were mourned for six months, aunts and uncles for two months, and only a month for first cousins. But a widow was expected to mourn for two and a half years. A society widow went through several stages. Heavy, deep mourning was the first stage of full mourning. 
when a woman might cover her head in a veil. Then she would graduate into uncovering her head, but still remain in widow's weeds. During the first year and one day after a death, widows were only allowed to emerge from their homes if they were in full mourning regalia, including a veil. Second mourning would continue for the next 12 months before half mourning where would become appropriate the last six months. Widows would have to wear crepe through the first two years following a husband's death, and crepe is derived from the Latin crispare, meaning to curl. The Victorian mourning crepe was imported originally from Bologna. A widower, by contrast, was expected to wear black crepe on his hat or armband for only six months. However, wartime did allow for relaxation as when Susan Caldwell of Warrington, Virginia, wanted to wear mourning weeds but was forbidden to do so by her husband in the army for reasons of economy. Scarcity of cloth was a problem as much as impoverished coffers in the South. Blockade runners tried to stem the tide of deprivation but by war's end had failed. In the North, family members found textiles and suggestions for costumes readily available. Indeed, there had been a boom in mourning wear imported from England where Queen Victoria's mourning for her husband, Albert, triggered a rise in what was called the black branch of the fashion industry. In the States, Godey's Ladies Book consistently featured a half-page, hand-tinted portrait of a group. And at least one of these costumes was for mourning, even if it was a leghorn hat trimmed with a black plume. Bombazine, a cloth with a silk warp, a worsted weft and twilled finish became the basic fabric of widow's weeds. Mourning crepe, crimped into three-dimensional patterns, was essential for trim, draped over skirts, the recognized symbol of loss. In 1869, in her household management, Mrs. Beaton offered advice on the renovation of crepe. Mourning jewelry also became a preoccupation of the fashionable, as memento mori. Remember, you must die, gain popularity. Mourning jewelry was required to have a dull finish like widow's weeds. This came from the ancient superstition concerning reflected images, turning portraits to the wall, covering mirrors. So women were discouraged from wearing anything but dark, dull finishes. Jet or onyx were popular. Flowers and fauna were a favorite decor on this jewelry because of their symbolism. Ivy for immortality, myrtle as a sign of love and victory. Forget-me-nots and pansies were used as symbols of remembrance. The mauve shade of the pansy became especially popular as a shade acceptable for costumes for half-mourning. This era also ushered in the fashion for charms and pieces made of hair. We know how central hair can be to grief as the cutting of hair has been associated with mourning. In the Balkans, women might cut off their hair and leave it as a sign of respect on the graves of beloved deceased. The use of hair in European memento mori jewelry dates back to the 17th century. In the early 1800s, French prisoners of the Napoleonic War living in Tunbridge Wells in Kent were famed for their skills in making decorative hair jewelry. Bracelets, necklaces, earrings, Watch chains and other items became treasured mementos. As Godey's Ladies Book suggested, hair is at once the most delicate and lasting of our materials and survives us like love. It is so light, so gentle, so escaping from the idea of death that with a lock of hair belonging to a child or a friend, we may almost look up to heaven and compare notes, may almost say, I have a piece of thee here. Now, I did bring along some pieces of mourning jewelry that I've collected, and I can uh, say that the museum didn't trust me to pass them around, but I am going to leave them up front for those of you who might want to see some filigree earrings made out of hair. On the back of one of the pieces, <coughs> the date and the age of the deceased. Also, lovers might braid their hair together and put it in a piece of jewelry and carry it off to war. <coughs> the death of a child was something with which Mary Lincoln was painfully familiar. She had lost her second-born Eddie when he came down with a bad case of diphtheria, and after 52 days of suffering, 
His body gave up the struggle. The boy died a few weeks shy of his fourth birthday in 1850. Mary's mother and stepmother had each lost babies. Her sister Elizabeth had lost her firstborn in 1836. But Eddie Lincoln's death was a terrible blow to the couple. Lincoln suffered stoically, writing to his brother three weeks after his toddler's funeral. We miss him very much. While Lincoln mourned with reticent dignity, his wife found herself consumed with mourning, severe weeping spells, and a lack of appetite. Lincoln sought out Dr. James Smith, the cleric who had conducted Eddie's funeral service, to counsel his grieving wife. Smith gave um, Mrs. Lincoln, Smith got Mrs. Lincoln through a very difficult period. She penned verse to commemorate her boy's death. Bright is the home to him now given, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. She also officially joined Smith's church in 1852. Lincoln's faith and the meaning of his church attendance remains a subject of lively engagement among Lincoln scholars. Whatever his spiritual proclivities, Lincoln seems to have had a, an appreciation of Reverend Smith's pastoral care of his wife, and we know that he enjoyed his bracing theological discussions as well. Bearing Eddie might have been one of the hardest things the Lincolns had ever done. For each of them, the death of a loved one was represented by the return of a dark shadow. The Lincolns did not intend to forget this most treasured boy, but they wanted to climb out of the deep trench of sorrow, and they joyfully greeted the birth of William Wallace Lincoln four days before Christmas in 1850. His safe arrival, so close to the holiday celebration, provided a godsend for the entire family and lifted the gloom. The birth of Willie Lincoln within 10 months of Eddie's death seemed to signal a renewed commitment to the couple's union. Mary also regained her footing as a mater familias, first with Willie and then with her fourth and final child, Thomas Lincoln, born April 1853. This son was nicknamed Tad, presumably because his very large head at birth had reminded his father of a tadpole. But even after the birth of two more babies, Mary confided to a friend in July 1853 that about Eddie, she did not feel sufficiently submissive to our loss. Seven years later, during Lincoln's run for the White House, her sister and brother-in-law, Anne and Clark Smith, lost their 10-year-old to typhoid fever. A family funeral in the middle of jubilant politicking was a sobering reminder of Mary's good fortune with her three healthy sons. She longed especially to see Robert, who had been sent away to school and had been gone for nearly a year. She confessed to being wild to see him. Mrs. Lincoln was known as an emotional mother who rarely imposed discipline on her younger sons born after the loss of Eddie. With her husband's election and the move to Washington, as well as an impending war on the horizon, she struggled against the odds to keep her husband and family on an even keel. Once in the White House, Mrs. Lincoln struggled to keep Sunday, her family activities, and her sons enjoyed the egg rolling on the White House lawn, which took place on Easter Monday, April 1st in 1861. The Lincolns attempted to keep their boys diverted from the more serious matters swirling around. Even Mrs. Lincoln's talents could not withstand the pressures brought to bear following Fort Sumter in April 1861. As William Stoddard would later suggest, war has no Sunday, no day of rest, no hour that is sacred above all others. The next month, the family was rocked by the death of Elmer Ellsworth, whose death in Alexandria, Virginia, became a touchstone for the nation embarked on a course of war. The Ellsworth funeral on May 25th single, signaled the Lincoln's first personal contact with loss, the first son fallen to the enemy. Willie and Tad were somber. The family was comforted by the arrival of their oldest son, Robert, on May 27th. The White House was not an easy place for the Lincoln family to maintain equilibrium, just as the boys were getting used to the loss of their hero, Colonel Ellsworth, another White House favorite, Colonel Baker, was killed in action at Ball's Bluff on October 21st. Baker's funeral on October 24th was another emotional family ordeal. Mrs. Lincoln wore a dress in a shade of purple to Baker's funeral instead of the traditional black. This Victorian fashion of wearing purple for mourning was only recently introduced 
and it offended some Washington ladies, which added to the controversy over her own Confederate ties and her multiple shortcomings, according to detractors. Mrs. Lincoln became embroiled in layers of scandal, more than just a tiff over the shade of her dress. Although complaints about refurbishment of the White House would persist into the new year, in 1862, Mrs. Lincoln was so confident about her role as First Lady that she proposed to reform a routine and suggested they substitute large receptions for expensive state dinners because it would be more in keeping with the democratic institutions of our country. When she first broached the subject, her husband was skeptical, but her arguments won out. One of Lincoln's secretaries, John Nicolay, proclaimed, La Reine has determined to abrogate dinners, and La Reine got her way. Indeed, the Lincolns were the first residents of the White House to see the potential of making their home a national stage. They introduced the practice of bringing artists and performers into the executive mansion. She decided to throw a very large ball in early February and was in the thick of her plans by mid-January. Mary decided to issue 700 invitations and planned to funnel these guests into the East Room. Of course, we know that she would issue many invitations and funnel them into the Lincoln home, so she was quite adept at this idea of the flow during her parties. Not only the work of such an event, but the worries associated became acute to the Lincoln secretaries, who were by this time openly hostile to Mrs. Lincoln, referring to her as Hellcat behind her back. Mary was firmly convinced that a diversion was absolutely necessary. She ignored Senator Benjamin Wade, who wrote indignantly, are the President and Mrs. Lincoln aware that there is a civil war? If they are not, Mr. and Mrs. Wade are not, and for that reason, decline to participate in dancing and feasting. Mr. Lincoln decided to veto any dancing, but feast they did, heaping plates of partridge, quail, duck, turkey, beef, and the President's favorite, oysters, greeted guests, as well as elegantly appointed Lincoln with his wife Mary at his side, a cake in the shape of a fort, an elegant sugar spun dessert amused the throng. The Marine Band paid the Mary Lincoln polka, a piece composed to honor the First Lady. The rooms were not overcrowded because only about 500 showed up, but the Washington Star pronounced it the most superb affair of its kind ever seen here. However, dissenters composed a counter ditty my Lady President's Ball, which offered mournful verses composed from the perspective of a wounded soldier bemoaning the follies of the White House. Satires and lampoons appeared in several journals. The only thing that nearly caused Mrs. Lincoln to postpone the event was a fever suffered by her beloved Willie. Living in the White House less than a year, this favorite chi child represented the dearest hopes of his parents. Because of his resemblance to his father, it was assumed that he was his father's favorite child. Mary was deeply fearful when he fell ill. When he didn't improve rapidly, she wanted to do away with the ball, but Lincoln prevailed on her to wait and see. They called in Dr. Robert Stone, who pronounced the boy was in no immediate danger. Elizabeth Keckley had shifted from Mrs. Lincoln's dressmaker to an indispensable member of the household. She was drafted on the night of the ball to take care of Willie. When Lincoln first saw his wife in her white satin dress that night with a long train and a neckline, he'd remarked, phew, our cat has a long tail tonight. When this failed to get a response, he went on, mother, it's my opinion, if some of that tail was nearer to the head, it would be in better style. This easy banter demonstrates that they were not in the grip of anxiety, leaving Willie to Mrs. Cackley. Lincoln, unwilling to cancel the event, the couple, however, did absent themselves several times to look in on Willie during the evening. Under watchful eyes, his breathing grew labored. By the next day, his situation deteriorated, and the papers reported the boy's condition over the next several days. Lincoln canceled a cabinet meeting. Mary omitted her regular White House levy. Intimates reported the terrible trials of the family, that the president was nearly worn out with grief and watching. Willie's dear friend, Bud Taft, attended the sick room, trying to help him rally. The president would find the Taft boy asleep on the floor, 
fearful to leave Willie's side. When Tad became sick as well, segregated into another bedroom, Lincoln's official correspondence included a reference to his domestic affliction. Although the government was moving ahead with plans to celebrate Washington's birthday with an illumination of public buildings, the Lincolns remained grim. The president was distracted. His wife was paralyzed. She sat next to Willie's bed day by day, trying to re erase memories of the sick bed vigil she spent a dozen years before. Finally, his mother's constant prayers, his father's nightly visits, failed to rouse Willie from his permanent slumber. The boy breathed his last on a long gray winter afternoon, dying February 20th around 5 p.m. As the light slipped away, so did their boy. The Lincolns were inconsolable. Keckley washed and dressed the body and watched as the president looked down on his child. My poor boy, he was too good for this earth. God has called him home. I know that he is much better off in heaven. But then we loved him so. It is hard, hard to have him die. Lincoln sobbed over the small, frail body laid out on the bed. Mrs. Lincoln's grief was volcanic as she gave into hysteria, convulsions. Tad collapsed felled by sorrow. Robert, called home from college, struggled to control his grief. The White House was shaken to the core. William Stoddard suggested that malaria had felled him, while some papers suggested typhoid, typhoid had killed Willie. Whatever the cause of death, the loss was a heavy burden for the entire mansion. Attorney General Bates sadly remembered supplying the young boy with marbles when he visited the White House. The president had gone immediately from Willie's deathbed to Tad's sick room, recognizing that something must be done for this ailing boy in the wake of the calamity. He knew his wife wouldn't be up to tending to Tad, so Rebecca Pomroy, a nurse working in a Washington hospital, was ordered to the White House. The days following Willie's death were an incredible strain on the president. His wife was too stricken to get out of bed. News of federal military victories flooded in, the capture of Fort Henry in Tennessee and the surrender of Fort Donelson. Hundred gun salutes competed with the tolling of bells. Mrs. Lincoln wrote to Mrs. Taft to ask her to keep her boys at home for the funeral. The president overruled his wife to invite Bud to have one last visit to Willie before he was put into the casket. Willie was laid out in the green room. The family planned a funeral service in the East Room to be conducted by Dr. Gurley, the pastor of the New York Presbyterian Church. Mary joined Robert, Tad, and Abraham for a final private farewell. She refused to subject herself to public services. White House mirrors were covered in crepe, and bouquets surrounded the body. Members of Congress and the Cabinet, as well as generals, diplomats, crowded in to pay their respects. Lincoln went with the casket to a vault at Oak Hill Cemetery in Georgetown. The day of the funeral, a dramatic storm seized Washington, blowing out the skylights at the Library of Congress, toppling church steeples, collapsing buildings throughout the city. It was as if the heavens had opened up in protest. Lincoln had his own mourning ritual, locking himself in the green room on the Thursday after Willie died. He wanted to be alone to meditate on the one-week anniversary, as well as for several Thursdays thereafter, in the very room where his son's body had lain. The president was occasionally called out of meetings by Tad to give him his medicine. He ignored convention and counsel, indulging the boy shamelessly. Perhaps it was his way of putting his mourning over Willie into the background by putting his son Tad in the forefront. While the two remaining Lincoln sons struggled to help their father cope with their mutual grief, Mary retreated. She took to her bed. She drew no practical relief from visiting friends. Only the trappings of mourning seemed to rouse her. Lincoln feared that his wife might never re regain her equilibrium. Elizabeth Keckley recounted Lincoln's taking his wife to the window of the White House, pointing out St. Elizabeth's, a mental hospital in the distance, and warning her she might have to be sent there if she could not recover. A gush of obituaries reopened her wounds. Nathaniel Willis's tribute to Willie. He retained his prairie habits, unalterably pure and simple, till he died. 
His leading trait seemed to be a fearless and kindly frankness, willing that everything should be as different as it pleased, but resting unmoved in his own conscious single-heartedness. As her husband and son, Tad, became closer, Mary let anxieties engulf her, wrapping around her like wraiths of fog, refusing to lift. But the good counsel of women, like the wife of her husband's secretary of the Navy, Mary Jane Wells, who would lose six children herself, and nurse Rebecca Pomeroy, as well as other spiritual advisors, supported Mary during the initial weeks of grief. The family moved out to a cottage at the soldier's home to find a change of scenery. Lincoln and his young son enjoyed being surrounded by the men in uniform. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton was assigned a residence near Lincoln's. Stanton rarely spent the night at the soldier's home, sleeping more often at his house on K Street, nearer to the War Department. But he moved his family to the cottage for the summer in 1862. The Stanton's young son, James, became ill. He took a turn for the worse at the end of June. Ellen Stanton's sigped vigil created a terrible dilemma for Mary. She had been out of the cottage less than a month when the Stanton boy became ill. She came to escape the memories of her own son's ordeal. Lincoln had gone into Virginia to rally the troops. When the, when the um, summons came from the, war, uh, from, from the cottage to the War Department to Stanton to come, the baby is dying. With her husband away, engulfed by these memories, Mary packed her bags and took Tad and Robert to New York. The very next day, the Stanton's child, less than two years old, died of his illness brought on by smallpox inoculation. When Mary returned to Washington mid-July, she embarked on a program of ministering to soldiers, which her location close to hospitals encouraged. By the summer, nearly 8,000 soldiers in the district were sick and wounded and their care was a critical concern to the women volunteers of Washington. Mary threw herself headline into, headlong into this new vocation. Work was a cure for low spirits. Novelist Ann Stevens accompanied Mary Lincoln during several of these tours, walking for hours through the wards to say cheering words of hope and encouragement. Visitors commented during this period, Mrs. Lincoln lost control of her emotions regularly. When a reporter, Laura Redden, stopped at the cottage in August of 1862, Mary Lincoln could greet her warmly, but then she burst into a passion of tears. And Redden was so moved that she broke protocol and embraced the First Lady. Of course, fresh torrents of grief flowed freely when her young half-brother, Alexander Todd, died of wounds received at the Battle of Baton Rouge on August 19th. Mrs. Lincoln never publicly acknowledged the deaths of any Confederate relatives, but privately mourned these additional losses. Indeed, baby Alex had been a particular favorite of Mary's. But Alex's youthful death, struck down by friendly fire, deepened her melancholy. Struggling with her over-emotional nature, Mary Lincoln found herself enthralled by an increasingly popular Civil War pastime, spirit circles. These were gatherings organized by mediums, communing with those who had crossed over, talking with the dead. This belief in contact with the dead was one of the fastest growing movements in 19th century America, accelerated by mourning Civil War deaths. The attempt to reach out to those taken proved irresistible to Mary in her weakened state and to in hundreds, if not thousands, of other mothers during the war. The rise of Victorian sentimentality blended nicely with spiritual philosophy. A few years before the war, Oliver Wendell Holmes reflected on the spiritualist culture in the New York Tribune. While some are crying against it as a delusion of the devil, some are laughing at it in hysteric folly, and some are getting angry with it as a mere trick of interested, mischievous persons. Meanwhile, spiritualism is quietly undermining traditional ideas of the future state which have been and are still accepted. It's a kind of fearful symmetry that the telegraph, along with the concept of electrical forces, premiered in 1848, just when the Fox sisters in upstate New York burst into the headlines. It was no accident that their talent was described as spiritual telegraph which allowed them to communicate with those who had passed over. 
When Mary Lincoln sought out spiritualists in the summer of 1862, she was too needy to be cautious. Her dabbling in the spirit world, not her good works in the hospital wards, stimulated gossip. By 1863, Mary Lincoln's association with charlatans continued to tarnish her reputation. The memoirs of spiritualist Nellie Colburn asserted that she knew both the Lincolns from spirit circles and that Lincoln himself was a spiritualist. So in many ways, the death of Willie symbolized the tragic loss of a beloved son, any mother's child, and the loss of what might have been. Mary Lincoln's plunge into spiritualism was symptomatic of the era when millions averted their faces from what was, longing for what could never be. Verena Davis took no such dive with the loss of her beloved Little Joe in the spring of 1864. Verena was no stranger to mourning, nor was her husband Jefferson. Indeed, she had to undergo the very stressful ordeal of being a 19-year-old bride on honeymoon when her new husband, the 37-year-old widower Jefferson, took her to the grave of his first wife, who had died 10 years earlier. She had very difficult relations with her husband's older brother Joseph, who was like a surrogate father to Jefferson. Joseph's family management included moving a widowed sister-in-law and orphan children into the Jefferson Davis Plantation home, which did not endear him to Verena. Luckily, she escaped Mississippi when her husband entered the House of Representatives shortly after their marriage, following his distinguished military service in the U.S.-Mexican War. In 1847, he became the U.S. Senator from Mississippi. Next, he was drafted by Franklin Pierce as Secretary of War in 1853. Anyone interested in Davis's political style would do well to dip into Guy Gugliotta's wonderful book, Freedom's Cap, which not only tells the fascinating story of the rebuilding of the Capitol Dome, but it's a colorful, compelling narrative of congressional politics during this decade leading up to the Civil War, including some of Davis's more memorable schemes, like his idea for a camel brigade. By the 1850s, Verena Davis had become a popular society hostess. Laura Holloway complimented the home of Mrs. Jefferson Davis was much more the gay center of Washington society than was the White House. Davis was in no way trying to supplant the First Lady, but rather understood that Jane Pierce had, sleep, had slipped into deep mourning. When her husband was elected president in 1852, she had already lost two sons. But on their way to Washington for the inauguration, the Pierce's only remaining child, a son, was killed in a railway accident before his mother's very eyes. She spent most of her husband's administration as a recluse, and the Smithsonian today has one of her gowns for half mourning in its collection, a black silk taffeta skirt with an overskirt of black tulle embroidered with silver dots. While Jane Pierce was distracted by her grief, Verena Davis unofficially shouldered some of the First Ladies entertaining. Davis herself had been a social ingenue at 19 when her husband had taken her to the Polk White House, but as a skilled matron, she made sure every member of the House of Representatives received at least one invitation to a Davis fete during the winter. The demands of family and society, politics and private concerns were a challenge throughout the 1850s. In April 1859, the couple faced their own personal crisis when they welcomed a new son, which Verena very much wanted to name for her father, William Howell. But Jefferson Davis had another plan and insisted that they name the boy Joseph E. Davis after his beloved brother. But as William Cooper has documented, this was someone who Verena believed was her nemesis. The wrangle over the baby's name was debilitating Verena conceded it was her husband's right to make such a decision, but she was so sickened by this quarrel that she decamped to the um, mountains in Maryland with her friend, the daughter of Montgomery Blair. Joseph Davis was so thrilled with the news that he did what he could to reward his brother's wife. When little Joe was just a baby, his namesake uncle offered to pay an all-expense-paid tour to Europe for Verena, for her three children, a nurse, all to accompany him on the grand tour. Verena declined. 
Her resentment had not abated by 1861 when on a visit to Richmond, Joseph confessed in private to her that the naming of this child had obliterated all memories of any ill feeling between them. But she refused to let bygones be bygones, and she told Joseph she knew how much her husband loved his brother and that she would require her children be respectful. But I owe you nothing and perfectly appreciate your hostility to me. It would seem that by the time Davis became the Confederate president, by all reports, the couple were reconciled and were operating as a team. Verena had been so disturbed by their first home, but now she resided in a three-story Italianate mansion, fitted with gas-burning chandeliers and rich American Rococo revival furnishings in the house at Twelfth and Clay in Richmond, leased by the Confederate government to serve as its executive mansion. By the time they moved into their new home, little Joe was reportedly his father's favorite, climbing on his papa's lap at the dinner table and entreating his father to join him nightly in prayers before bed. And in December of 1861, Verena gave birth to another son, who this time was called William Howell Davis. Visitors to the Confederate White House were charmed by the children both Joe and Jeff wore Confederate uniforms, and observers commented that, like many young boys, they had unbroken wills. They were doted on, and by the late 1863, it was clear that Davis's melancholy could only be broken by his children's visits as a great diversion. So it was with the deepest tragedy when Verena Davis had just arrived at her husband's office at the Customs House, taking him his lunch midday, April 30th, 1864, when a servant showed up to fetch him and his wife, Joe had taken a fall off the piazza at the mansion. Verena later recounted that she left him playing happily with the other children and their Irish nurse, but apparently Joe had wandered off out onto the balcony where workers had lumber piled up doing renovations. Whether he was climbing the balustrade or some other scenario, his body was found on the brick courtyard pavement below by his brother Jeff, who began to wail. He could not wake his brother, and Jeff told their neighbor, who arrived before the boy's parents, that he had prayed to God, but he could not wake Joe up. The boy was still alive when Verena and Jefferson found him. He had a skull injury, two broken legs, but he expired before the doctor arrived. Jefferson Davis repeatedly chanted over his son's dead body, not mine, O Lord, but thine. The parents hovered over the lifeless corpse. When a courier arrived with a dispatch from General Robert E. Lee requiring a response, Davis sought help from his wife, but they turned it over to a military attache. Davis was refusing to rest while Verena awaited the return of her sister Margaret, who was away for the day. Close family friend Mary Chestnut, wife of former South Carolina Senator James Chestnut, was leaving the Confederate capital the next day. She had taken Margaret out on a boat on the James River for a day with friends for a picnic. Mrs. Davis sent her carriage to fetch the group. Mary Chestnut recorded that on the ride back to the Davis home, the silence was broken only by Maggie's hysterical sobs. When the party arrived, the house was lit up in every room, but the mansion was totally silent. The Chestnuts postponed their departure to attend funeral, which was an amazing outpouring of grief. The people of Richmond took the opportunity to shower the Davis family with condolences. The death became a public event as nearly a thousand children wound up the hill to Hollywood Cemetery for Joe's burial, while the president and his pregnant wife stood witness. Each child dropped a bunch of spring flowers or a green spray on the plot which was a mass of white flowers. Burton Harrison recalled the terrible self-control of Jefferson Davis was even more heartbreaking. Constance Carey, who would become Burton's bride, remarked that Davis looked older than his 55 years, and she was haunted by Verena's mournful eyes. So many of the mourners were struck by the cloaked figure of the First Lady, bearing one child while pregnant with another. Davis's biographer commented, Richmond had no remembrance of a more moving funeral. On May 2nd, Jefferson Davis returned to his office, the business of the nation and war. Verena was complimented as well on her brave face 
Mrs. Davis, although she was in mourning, courageously fulfilled all the social duties of her position. The First Lady delivered her seventh and final child, a daughter, on June 27th, christened Verena Ann. She was nicknamed Pie Cake by her family. However, to the rest of the country, she came to symbolize her father's dream, and she became known as the daughter of the Confederacy. She never saw the balcony from which her brother fell to his death. In September, her father had the workmen tear it down. When he was later locked up in prison following the fall of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis was brought a twig from the grave of his son Joe, and he meditated on that little mound to which was laid so much of my tenderest love and highest hope of earthly things. Davis died in 1889 and was reunited with his son at a grave site in Richmond in 1893. Mary Lincoln was unable to make the train trip with her husband's remains, accompanied by Willie's coffin, on the funeral train back to Springfield in 1865, but she was buried at Oak Ridge Cemetery in 1882 with three of her sons and her husband, the martyr president, in whose honor she wore black for the remainder of her life. Verena Davis buried six of her seven children and a husband. She would confide to her remaining daughter, Margaret, shortly before her own death in 1906. I'm going to die. Don't you wear black. It's bad for your health and will depress your husband. <laughs> and it's with this uplifting advice that I conclude. Thank you. <laughs>